very roots of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can This is a typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce our discussion, we just want to mention briefly, we do have a Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider maybe tossing us a dollar a month there. Today, Taylor and I are going to be taking a look at the first section of Max Stirner's The Unique and Its Property, one I've been looking forward to discussing with Taylor for a few years. So very excited to hear your perspective on this. Don't hold back and don't pull any punches. I want you to be fully like, if you need to destroy Sterner, let's build an effigy. On the contrary, I and and yeah, you've been very patient, honestly, because I do feel like it's someone you've I think maybe even before I joined the podcast officially, you were kind of I knew you were keen on, right? Yeah. So it's um it is a long time coming now we have we have had people on to discuss sterner with us you know we we talked a little bit about sterner although more so schmidt with yeah. saul newman did yeah we have him on and we did yes and we talked and we talked with elmo fighting who that's you know, true I, uh, I had i forgot about is, <laughs> about that ah. yeah El- elmo that that episode was probably two years old by now we looked at some of his essays, and one of which kind of shows a rapprochement, if you will, between Deleuze and Sterner, if I remember correctly. Although we looked at a couple of his pieces. So it wasn't that one of his pieces, though, on, on Deleuze and, and Sterner and kind of some of their... Or uh, Newman or Elmo? Elmo. Elmo Fighten. Didn't he have like a piece on Deleuze and Sterner? I can't remember. I know that Saul Newman absolutely has numerous pieces. Yeah. And the opening to Jacob Blumenfeld's book, All Things Are Nothing to Me, you know, Blumenfeld shows himself, I think, to be a very widely read theorist and connects Sterner to a number of thinkers, including someone like Adorno, for example, if you just look at like the first 10 pages of Negative Dialectics, you can see how Adorno is doing something that kind of accords with Scherner, where in any dialectical movement, there's always this core or kernel, sorry, of that which cannot be like dialectized away, if you will, right? There's always this kind of like remainder of the dialectic. But anyway, in Blumenfeld's book, he, he's really good to like uh, connect it up to current day thinkers. And I read a piece in Newman's edited volume. I think it's just called Max Stirner, a Palgrave book. I think it was 2011. So before the new translation, it, uh, I forget, it it was an Italian fellow, and I wish I remembered his name, but he does a good job at kind of looking how, looking at how Stirner changes the people before and after him. It's this interesting kind of way of this temporal shift of like looking at how Stirner changes not just the people that come after him, but the people that came before him, that in light of Stirner, you you get a different sense. So like one example being like the early Hegel, you kind of see sort of bits and pieces of Stirner are more emphasized. I won't go into all of that. I'm just thinking about the little bit of like extra material that I tried to read to situate what I was gaining from this first part and by first part it's it's pretty lengthy right i mean this is 160 pages more than we usually do in one sitting unless we have a guest on and are trying to tackle a, a book but if anything i mean the one little also the one little bit of that we probably didn't even talk about sterner enough was when we did in two parts and this is just to remind us and the listeners deleuze's nietzsche and philosophy where deleuze 
both, if you will, maybe pigeonholes Sterner as showing the truth of the dialectic to be ending in nihilism. And so that might seem like it's a negative. And I, I re-looked at it. It's probably about five, six pages, or maybe maybe closer to 10 because it's a few sections, right? In any case, he does seem to be fairly generous to Sterner. Now, he may, again, like saying that Sterner shows the truth of dialectic to, to end in nihilism, that may seem like a, like a diss. But if you get that the, the end goal is a kind of using Nietzsche as a thorough anti-Hegelian figure, whether right. or not we agree with that as a whole, and you can find that, those elements in Nietzsche. I think Deleuze may overemphasize it, but, you know, he's doing his productive buggery shit <laughs> that we talked about. Right. I do feel like one of the ways that he begins the section, I think it's section five called Against the Dialectic or something like this. He, first of all, says something that I really, really like, which is like, look, we can't necessarily just look at who an author cites by name or at their library in order to find influences. There's something superficial about that. And so the fact that the name Schroener, or as you know, is much more discussed, the name Marx doesn't appear in Nietzsche's works doesn't necessarily mean that he was completely ignorant of these figures or wasn't influenced by them. Now, whether or not he read the ego on its own, or as Landstriker translates it, the unique in its property, whether or not he read that directly is probably, it's most likely that he didn't. But on the other hand, I think that Deleuze is trying to show that the no notion of like a direct knowledge is perhaps a bit more abstract. And we have to be like, we have to be careful not to dismiss connections that might exist. Which is why when you read someone like Scherner, and I posted on Twitter that, that passage about Protestantism sort of being the fulfillment of, of a kind of internal police, if you will, right? This internalization of the police, which sounds, first of all, it also sounds very anti-Oedipus, right? You can see in um, like Foucault's preface to anti-Oedipus, because you said you kind of got to Scherner through reading some Foucault in grad school, or at least you saw some like vibes there. So you can see something about this critique of like the internal police, obviously vibing with Deleuze and Guattari, but sounding, sounding quite Nietzschean to a certain extent. There's no doubt about that. But the second big compliment, and it's hard to necessarily parse, but Deleuze, when he references Der Einzige, right, Sterner's book that we are focusing on today, he calls it a great book. Now, in French, the word grand can mean big, but I mean, Scherner's book, yes, it's long, but I mean, in terms of books, it's 300, 400 pages. So maybe above average, but not, it's not, you know, the science of logic size, right? So I don't think it's just his big book. I do think it's his, I do think Deleuze means that as a compliment, and he seems to be pretty serious. It was interesting looking back at those sections where he discusses Sterner because I, in my head, I'd only really kept that main point about Sterner showing the uh, how the dialectic ends in nihilism. But he he has a sustained discussion of Sterner for about for about ten pages, and so it's, so it's a lot deeper than I remembered, which is why it's good to sometimes revisit some of this material, even stuff that we've devoted episodes to. You know, you can't do it all at once. You know, so Sterner has been in and out of our uh, our discussions, I think, for years now. And um, I had read little bits and pieces here and there. And of course, stuff that you had shared with me. But this is the first time I like sitting down and reading through. I feel at this point, and I may feel differently after finishing the whole book, which I hope we can do. I know we have several kind of open-ended book projects going on. But once we finish this book, I may put forward some criticisms. But at this point, I mean, I think the only thing I told you, if it's even a criticism, it's not really, it's that it's a good thing that Sterner is a little bit repetitive. He repeats some of his main points, but varies it in a different way, right? It's like a playing on a refrain. There are some like main refrains throughout this first um, 150 pages. And I don't even think that's a criticism. That's just a, a stylistic choice. 
you know, you could criticize him a little bit for some of the organization that he's going through, but there even is, you know, a kind of parody parallel of Feuerbach's essence of Christianity in the sections in which, you know, Feuerbach is replacing God with man. And so, of course, this section that we read today is called Mensch, right? Or Der Mensch das. It's man, or as um, I think Wolfie Sh- Landstriker translates it as the human. Is that right? Or humanity, something like that, right? Humanity. There you go. And I think that's fine. That works. What about you? I mean, like your reread, because you have read this before. Did you feel like you got some new stuff out of it? Maybe some, some different emphases going on? Was it more like revisiting an old friend? How were you feeling? Honestly, I felt like this first section was kind of like, boring because i remember this being i remember it's preliminary like, or something maybe yeah i remember really enjoying the overall experience of the read the first time all the way through quite a bit yeah and it being among my favorite books i think maybe just like is it too the, familiar to you do you feel perhaps i don't i don't know like mm-hmm. i guess a lot of the emphasis in the first section is like about religion and so forth yeah. and i don't mean that's just kind of old hat a little bit yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> even yeah, though yeah. like that's not entirely the focus like there's some other stuff that's in there that's of interest but i think that maybe i'll be I'll interested to see the remaining two sections of the text i think will yield maybe some more interesting discussions that can branch out but i also yeah. just as like a housekeeping note for listeners i wanted to mention that I have done a pretty thorough series before Taylor joined the podcast on this book with some other people, Elliot Rosenstock and uh, John Zigterman, and I think maybe even someone else. Uh, maybe it was just the three of us. But Did I'll Adam pu- ever show up for that? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. You're, um, that's who I was leaving out. Adam um, from Acid Horizon. Just, I, correct. I, I don't remember his, his last name. Sorry, Adam. Jones. So I'll post that playlist did you have Blumenfeld on? I before? did have Blumenfeld on as well, and we okay. hope to have him rejoining the two of us for a discussion. Yeah. He's got a book about Fichte, Hegel. I can't remember the title offhand, but he well, has you'd a, hope he might mention Sterner after writing a book. On he's him. got a uh, he's got a new book that looks at it's Fichte and Hegel for sure. I can't remember if there's Schelling or someone else, but um, hopefully we'll have him sometime in September, or October to discuss that book. But I'll post that original episode with Jacob as well. Yeah, there, there was an interesting part, and I'll try to remember this later because I didn't mean to interrupt you, where he criticizes Ficta or shows that his eye is different from Ficta's, but go on. I think that was probably it. I could also post some of the Saul Newman episode stuff because I think I did, I also did an episode with Saul before you joined. Did you discuss it in the the Better Call Saul episode? <laughs> I did, yeah. Yeah, we kind of looked at, mm-hmm. there's some similarities to some extent between Lacan and Stirner in a certain way. Yeah, and then another returning guest we're going to have on in next month is Dwayne Russell, and he's written about... Roselle. You know, it's Roselle? I believe so, yeah. I know it's spelled R-O-U-S-S-E-L-L-E, I believe. Russell, Roselle, uh, yeah, I mean... Something like that. You're right. He has written about Stirner before, post-anarchism. He's written about Lacan and Stirner and anarchism having some... I know he, yeah. his main focus these days is more on psychoanalysis in the Lacanian vein, but I think that, that part of that interest grew out of this interesting... I guess these weirdos writing about Lacan as an anarchist, despite what he may or may not have politically himself ascribed to, maybe against his own purview, he, there is a strand of thinkers that see a kind of latent anarchism in Lacanian psychoanalysis, which I think is great because, you know, it's kind of like what, what Scherner would say about thoughts, right? Just because Lacan elaborated certain thoughts doesn't mean necessarily that we have to respect them as though they were his property, right? It was starting to say, like, I'm going to appropriate and use them. And that's what Stringer says, too, for us to do with his works, right? It's not of his concern. It's not his affair, what we do with his words and to try to act like he is the master of them. I mean, the way that he puts it himself is if I were somehow to allow my thoughts, which have been thoughts, to concretize and then lord itself over me, I have sort of 
I have given up my own freedom and activity and become subservient to this past product. You know, the product of my labor would somehow become determinative of what I can produce and do. So that just goes to say that, you know, death of the author type shit is already kind of lurking a little bit in, um, in Sterner, but author in the broadest sense of creator, not necessarily just writings and thoughts, even though that comes under a lot of critique because thoughts are one of those, I think Landstriker translates it as a phantasm, which I think is fine. That's a good word for spook and spookin. Or like what wasn't one of the translations like ghosts or disembodied spirits or something like this, right? Although I think uh, German has its own word for the word ghost. But in any case, thoughts, ideals. There is an interesting transition from critiquing mind or geist and spirit to critiquing these ghosts. I mean, even in English, we talk about the Holy Ghost. Our language is saturated, or it, it it's very in a similar vein as as the German this relation to Geist. So all of these disembodied ideals that that haunt us. Yeah. Just generally for the listeners too, there's a pretty Saul Newman's done the majority of this work, but also, you know, like you said, Dwayne Roselle has written this vein too about these kind of overlaps or this sort of Similar trajectory to some degree between Stirner and some of the post-structuralist thinkers. You know, we've already mentioned Lacan, Deleuze, Foucault. I mean, I think later on in the book in particular, there'll be like shades of, it's been a year since I read it, but I remember kind of like finding some Foucauldian and even I think so like, Althu- like some Althusserian sort of yeah. vibes in there as well. Yeah, critique of ideology, right, is already kind of inherent in this work. I'm trying to remember exactly how Althusser defines ideology in the broadest sense, but it's like something like an imaginary relation to real conditions of existence or something like this, right? I'm obviously paraphrasing a little bit, but it's this imaginary relation to reality, if you will. You can see that that's already there in in Sterner, right? That we, we sort of approach reality first and foremost through these quote-unquote imaginary we have to be very broad with what that means but i think that that these phantasmatic aspects right we let thoughts ideals ideas be that which we sort of give our power over to and so in in the Foucauldian side there's a critique of power and where power comes from or let's say the other way around how it is invested obviously Foucault has a very nuanced understanding of power. But I do think that Scherner would agree with, with Foucault that, you know, there is this double-edged sword with knowledge. Knowledge obviously gives us power, but it institutes power, becomes an institution of power. And so there is a way in which knowledge can be invasive and, and disempower others as it empowers some with authority and blah, blah, blah. It's obviously different analytical tools and different methodologies, but, you know, critique of power makes a lot of sense in a broad sense for Stirner. And so I think that that allies him. And I think that part of it, too, is Foucault having a, a Nietzschean, an inheritor of Nietzsche, because you can see Nietzsche's, Nietzsche, too, is, is interested in power or, as Deleuze lays it out, in the play of forces and how they sort of determine power relations. Again, these are very broad strokes, but I think it's trying to perhaps show just in the way that Hegel is still, and Kant, right, still are these great figures to deal with in the history of philosophy since 18th, 19th century. Stirner deserves to be included among as an influencer, as an influence, as still having some sort of relevance. The most repressed element of German idealism by far. It's very possible. I mean, I absolutely think in particular, Marxists generally kind of dismiss offhand Stirner as a bourgeois idealist. 
based on what Sterner says, at least, I think that's doesn't have a whole carry a lot of water, let's say. I didn't want to read the German ideology <laughs> today or before. Um, I didn't want to look <laughs> back over it. I've looked at some of the German ideology. For the most part, I haven't focused on the St. Max sections because I didn't read it before I met you, the German ideology. I didn't read in and out of it. So I mainly focused on some of the other figures in there. But I wanted to wait till reading Der Einzige, Scherner's book, before reading Marx. And I would love to bracket that. I think that what's interesting, that there's that double-edged sword again, right, where I feel like it's possible Sterner's name might not have, even if it is repressed, like you said, it may not have lived on or be as prominent without Marx's critique. However, out of hand and, and dismissive and perhaps wrong headed, disparaging it may be, right? So there's that, that double edged sword. If, if Marx kind of helps to repress the name of Sterner, it's that, you know, he also lifts it up, right? There's a kind of alpha bung going on. And so it lives on in its own way, partly due to Marx's influence and how widely read Marx is. But I think that that may be not the whole picture, but it feels like it's some of the, the picture. I guess that's... Um... Another note of trivia, so to speak, would be kind of interestingly, Derrida, Inspectors Marx, also discusses Stirner quite a bit. Not quite a bit, but I mean... Obviously, that's a very difficult read, and there, there's a little bit of dialogue. I, obviously, you can kind of see, right, the specters of Marx, like the spook in Sterner, etc. The phantasm. But you know yeah. something? I didn't realize that there was a subtitle to this book, The State of Debt, The Work of Mourning, and The New International is the subtitle of Specters uh, of, of Marx. Yeah, 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 of Derrida's work, right. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that Derrida says that I think needs to be emphasized since obviously we didn't read it for today and maybe we'll come to it at some point where he says max should be read not only with max turner should be read not only with marx and his critique but specifically alone and outside of it that there is for derrida something valuable to be gained by reading sterner without keeping marx's comments in the german ideology chiefly in mind yeah, it's kind of interesting because I think one of Marx's big kind of critiques of I haven't read the German ideology, but I kind of vaguely recall reading this snippet and it may not have even been in that text, but I think this is a legit paraphrasing here it would be like Stirner thinks that if he merely like say he was drowning, he could merely think of air to save himself. But I don't think that's right. I don't think that no, Stirner, no, no. I don't think that Stirner believes I mean, even Hegel has this kind of weird materialist idealism thing going on to a certain extent. You know, I mentioned that in our kind of just texting that it's this idea. It's, it's, less, it's less materialist for me than objective. It's objective idealism rather than subjective idealism. But go on. I was going to say that there's a quote I've been thinking about all week just with regard to this and even going back to the reading of philosophy of right that we did. And it's from the Heath Ledger Joker, where he says, people are only as good as the world allows them to be. How I interpret that is that there's got to be some material force behind people acting in the, in the interest of the good. If you want to extend that from, or like, even if the end of, from my perspective, even the individual's good or society's good, and there has to be some material force, whether that be obviously something like desire because i think that even this even goes to this question that spinoza and reich and Deleuze and guattari articulate about the sort of servitude of capital right well see i don't even know if sterner would agree with that sentiment that individuals are only as good as the world allows them to be something like this right i don't think he would necessarily agree with that perspective of that whose point of view are we are we evaluating from? Are we evaluating from that of the world? Because that, that's not my affair. I mean, I think that's, that's what he would say. Yeah. And um, you put it correctly, like, is it this good that is set above me that I need to attain? That's basically his critique of, quote unquote, human liberalism, of, of the human with this, like, 
emphasis on the on the uh, definitive article. What I mean, like the human has now replaced God. I mean, I, I assume in German it's it's Mensch, right? So man with like a capital M has replaced God, but now that is still this ideal held over and above individuals, human beings who can never attain the human, this essence that is dominating me and directing how I should evaluate from my own affairs. So I think that that has to be kind of maybe taken as a cynical remark from Joker and that perhaps Sterner would would voice this, puppeteer it, but that wouldn't be the point of view of the egoist. If that makes sense, right? That wouldn't be that wouldn't be my affair. I suppose so. And I guess that this is important for another big credit that Deleuze gives to Stirner in Nietzsche and philosophy, where he says Stirner brought the dialectic. If he brought the dialectic to nihilism in the end, we can argue about that because for Stirner, as we know, if it's a nihilism, it's a creative nihilism because of the nothingness of my very being is creative. the self creation of not only, I mean, yeah. see, that's where it's interesting too. Cause you can kind of like, we as unique individuals all sort of contribute our creation of the world as it exists. Would you characterize it as a, I don't even know if this is even worth like a spontaneous creation of the world. We all create some corner of the world mm-hmm. and of ourselves out of, out of nothingness, out of this kind of deterritorialized nature of the human being that doesn't have, at least isn't so beholden to animalistic or certainly we're beholden to drives or something like that, but not instincts that are, we have some degrees of freedom in terms of our ability to generate ourselves and difference and, and whatnot, right? We're not so, we're not these mechanistic, obviously that's another whole can I'm, of worms talking I mean, about animals and such. I am glad that you brought up instinct versus drives, right? Because I think that for Sterner, instincts are not for myself as my creative nothingness, whatever. Instincts are sort of foreign to me to a certain extent. Insofar as the human being is, if there is a delimitation of drives in in humans, it's as though all of these, the spooks, the phantasms, ideas, essences... Yeah, they're kind of thought, raised to this thought, instinctual thoughts, status. And whatever, this, the realm of the spirit has become second nature to human beings, has become instinct, right. has become instinctualized. And I think that that's what Scherner is railing against, how these instincts are not, they do not adhere into me and they're not a part of my property. And we need to like find out ways to, as Laura Well might say, you know, for Laura Well, philosophy and philosophizability has become an instinct and certain would say it's it's reason reason is that ultimate spook of humane liberalism that erects the human as an essence above me and bec- and so reason becomes the instinct in this sense and so we have to even fight against reason and that is a direct line to nietzsche and foucault again but really quickly Deleuze's point in, you know, even if Stirner may bring the dialectic nihilism or show its truth, Stirner was the one to reorient the dialectic insofar as he conserves it while also canceling it out, right? But insofar as he conserves it, he reorients the dialectic around the question of which one or who. From whose point of view is reason to be this goal that I have to strive towards? It's no longer asking what, right? It's not asking what is man, which is this predetermines the question, but who is man? And insofar as he delves into this question, he finds out that I am not man. I am not the human being. I am much more. If I am a human being by, by any you know, nominalist sense, that does not determine my essence. And again, this is where I see like the unique one, der Einzige, being, you know, similar to Laura Wells' one, man as one, man qua one, right? Which is non numerical. If there is a number for, uh, for Sterner, you know, you could say it's one, but you might as well say it's zero. But again, n- n- it's not even about numericity, it's about that, you know, because you might as well say, 
Dorianziga is a non-intensive, a non-totalizable intensive multiplicity, right? You might as well say that. And this is why, you know, words like the individual is, you know, you have to parse it a little bit. And I think why um, you see commentators lament the fact that Der Einzige is translated as ego in Byington's first translation, right? The ego and its own. And calling it the unique one, perhaps maybe even like overemphasizes one if we understand it numerically. But if we th- understand it in a Laura Wells sense, I think that it works, right? All the, I mean, Laura Wells phrases like this, and I think it's very Sternarian. Who am I? Who am? He asks the question, right? And I'm not this question. I'm not the answer. I'm not this description. And I think that that's, that's the same thing with, with, with Sterner. There's something about, which is why the lamentation of the phrase egoist is, again, a kind of stand-in. Because Sterner wants to say that um, der Einzige, the unique, is not a concept. And I was trying to make this point to you, right, with Laruel and his little dictionary. He makes clear that these, the quote-unquote terms in the dictionary, are not concepts they're they're first terms right they're on this sort of quasi axiomatic basis there's a sense in which you know the unique one is not conceptualizable is not represented is not representable and it's it's a name but that name is not you know there's a determination if there is a determination it's like a last instance type right but that's not even really the same thing because I'm starting to conflate Laurel and Scherner, and I shouldn't force that conjunction. It's uh, that my thoughts and conceptualizations about myself may be helpful and give me some sense of power, but they still don't determine, right? There's a unilaterality in that non conceptualizability of Duranziga, of the unique. So I may have a name to help me talk about it. But we should be very clear about the fact that all my my thoughts and ideas and and talk about it, who I am, doesn't necessarily determine myself any better than these other spooks. We have to be very careful with that. So I think that that's, I think Sterner is trying to cordon off this, delimit this area that language cannot determine directly, yet for lack of something better, we have to use language and its limited means. We just have to be very clear about the limitations and not fall back into a kind of realm of spirit, mind, ideas, essences, and all of this kind of centralizing talk. One area where I think this criticism of Stirner as a bourgeois idealist falls short is for one, this early section, again, is, I think, a pretty scathing critique of liberal humanism and its failings. And one of the best and most sharp and distinct criticism he has is the way that liberals would view opposition movements. And this even goes back to a bit to Hegel's philosophy of right, because he brings up the same, I think, literally the same situation about the political assassination. And yes. He, the justifications, et cetera. You know, I think this critique really resonates with how liberals kind of view this current Palestinian Israeli conflict that's going on, right? The so called war, right? The Palestinians, they have to be committed to this moral authority, but Israel obviously does not, right? We in the US say, or US politicians say, Israel represents our ideas. The ideas of America are represented by Israel's behavior, which obviously you can kind of see imperialism and such that too. But it's like they give lip service to these ideas. But what they're really doing is this immoral thing. And what the Palestinians are doing, even in their alleged tactics, like if you want to consider their tactics, if you want to consider Hamas's tactics immoral, putting them in a double bind because this nonviolent this nonviolent method that is supposed to be the ideal of liberalism right this kind of bullshit idea obviously it doesn't work a lot of marxists will often cite engels on authority you know a revolution is the most authoritarian thing that 
there is, right? That famous quote, have any of these gentlemen ever seen a revolution? Stirner often is associated with anarchism, but I don't think he agrees that. I mean, I think he would agree with Engels here as far as this, I don't know, amorality with regard to resistance, opposition movements, well, revolution, you, yada, yada. I mean, if you look at his section on liberal humanism, he critiques the third estate, the French Revolution, because he wants to say that it, as a third estate, wants to like not only dismiss the other two estates, but instantiate itself as the only estate and raise itself higher and thereby become what he says like an absolute monarchy. And what he means is that all these other little monarchies, is basically what he calls them, are removed. So whether it be the guilds or these other forms of relatively autonomous powers that were in negotiation with the monarchy, which was called absolute monarchy, if you think about the kings, the estate itself becomes the absolute monarchy. And this is what he means by saying in liberal humanism, no one person is supposed to have a certain authority to give orders. The order, if you will, comes from this abstraction called the law, right? So insofar as, and this seems very Hegelian, right? Insofar as I accord my interests and my desires with the law, I am sort of buying into this categorical imperative where everybody else does so. And I recognize you as a person because you have submitted to the law, etc. So the absolute monarchy is now instantiated in this higher authority of the law, which goes to your point about what did this revolution kind of give us besides a higher authority, if you will, a more abstract one, a more impersonal one. So, I mean, I, I think that it's tough, right? Because for Deleuze, it's easy for history to say that revolutions are doomed from the start. I mean, for Deleuze, becoming revolutionary is a completely minoritarian affair and is completely different than the authorities that may raise themselves up in the wake of a revolution and reestablish a majoritarian mode and reestablish a type of status quo and a type of hierarchy and a type of authority. So the becoming can't be itself is different and outside of and opposed to history, which doesn't really see becomings, can only see this kind of weird retrospective action that condemns from from the 2020 hindsight that it may have. Exactly. But, yeah. it, but it also skews and distorts, I think. I would just add that in because I don't necessarily think that, I think that, 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 it, that it's, it's a question of, you know, I mean, this is Laura Wellian language, right? But like for Laura Well, there's a difference between revolution and rebellion. I feel like Sterner might be kind of close to this where revolution keeps a kind of, if you just think about it, it just kind of turns the tables, but doesn't necessarily, you know, quote unquote, yeah. de deconstruct the power. So yeah, you know, turning the tables can keep an authority structure intact in or even reinforce it. But rebellion isn't necessarily circular in that way. It's kind of the, the difference between a schism and a, and a heretical movement. A schismatic movement wants to break off and reconstitute itself as the true path and way to salvation, to the real, whereas heresy doesn't necessarily reconstitute an authority. It's a type of breaking away that isn't reconstituting a church. So I feel like Sterner is on that side. He's a rebel. He's a heretic. If you want to like give him some names. I think that this is where perhaps dismissing him as, as a nihilist is a bit heavy handed or a bourgeois idealist or something like this, right? Because he has a critique of the bourgeoisie throughout the, the liberal humanist section. Which to me sounds like this, a lot of it is kind of like this critique of a Kantian ethics of where process is elevated, the fixed ideas, as long as the process is followed and the process is perceived as just, the outcome must be accepted as just. Hegel does a little bit of spin on that where he says, well, the assassin, the political assassin doesn't really have the right 
to do so. But Sterner's like, well, this was a selfless act by this person that achieved a good end. And so ends means argumentation, the flip side, the dialectic of those of that, that sort of Kantian shit as well. I think that Sterner wants to show how right is originating in these abstractions that are set up to have power over us. Hegel wants to show how we buy into these things, right? Like uh, it's kind of SLC punk where it's, I didn't sell out, I bought in. There's this sense in which Hegel wants to show how we can really cash in our chips of freedom by buying into the, to the system, right? To civil society. We actualize our freedom by buying into what has been erected above us. Reason, for example, spirit, these phantasms for Sterner. That's the virulence of, of Sterner, where he wants to question whether or not buying in actually enhances my freedom. Qua I mean, a unique one. And for Sterner, that's, that's not the case. I have just alienated my freedom into what I've bought into law, the human propertylessness in the sense of, of his critique of kind of these early communist movements. Obviously he's writing in what is 1843, 1844. So like, yeah, I think the book prior, prior, prior to like, so we have to be, when, we, when he talks about communism or socialism, we need to be like a little bit clear because it is pre yeah, Marx. it's like at least, at least it's pre the the. It's like Marx. what's called utopian, the utopian yeah, socialism sure. right, of like right. what is it? Uh, Fourier, Fourier, Four, Fourier was, Fourier, was yeah. one of them. When was the Paris Commune? That was like what, 1871. So that's well, that's well after. Yeah, that's more like Nietzsche time. Yeah, Nietzsche would have been 27, 26, 27. One of my things now. Maybe why I view this book differently now is I'm starting to buy in to Hegel in the sense of, I think the liberal idea of freedom, and Sterner may even be guilty of it. I'll have to wrestle with that a bit further. But the liberal notion of freedom is freedom from obligation to other people. Freedom from. Freedom from, and I think specifically obligations. Obligations uh, that I have not set for myself, if exactly. that makes sense. I, yeah. I just, I'm just trying to be... Because I can <laughs> judicious, it, but, let's say. but even then, even then, the word obligation wouldn't necessarily work. But you could you could nuance it. I can set myself a goal, let's say, right, which I can also discard. I think that's that's the property in the broad sense that Sterner is is thinking of. Because obviously, one of the aspects of property for Hegel is that I can alienate it, I can get rid of it, I can dispose of it as I will. Anyway, continue. I guess so. One of my freedom from obligation. It's, it's the liberal conception is what you're saying, right? Yeah. And I think that in a kind of way that might be, I don't know, that has some resonance. But at the same time, it's like, I think that as a collective, as an aggregate at the molar level, it's obligation to other people. This is where the idea of people are only as good as we allow them as the world allows them to be or we allow them to be our obligations to treat one another equally under the law or under a contract exchange or whatever that provides a certain freedom like at the macro level so like as an aggregate i have to give up something some part of my will or desire gets subl sublimated to this desire for because true freedom would be like, oh, you're on your own. You're producing all your own shit. You're going to die. But that's abstract freedom for Hegel. Let's be fair, right? Gotcha. To kind of look at how the world operates in our time, I think it's lack of obligation to other people that seems to generate this, I don't know. So that I'm, lack of that that mutual recognition that Hegel is uh, yeah perhaps with, right? I'm thinking of like Elon Musk right like Elon Musk doesn't really have obligations to anyone he at least has the uh, ability abstractly to follow his supposed will to its ends and use other people as means to that end and that I think is a problem like there has to be a reciprocity of obligation and so. When you remove obligations to other people 
from a per individual. It's like the Homelander sort of thing. That really maybe crystallizes this idea a bit better would be a Homelander, a Superman, etc. Like they have no obligation to subordinate themselves to these these fixed ideas of morality and etc. And so there's an antisocial aspect of that that I think kind of rings true to me more so these days than I think growing up and even reading this book for the very first time, I think I still had that sort of liberal notion of a freedom is freedom from obligation to other people. Whereas it's like, it's really the investment in relationships and the social bond that allows any freedom that we have to be worthwhile in the first place. It's interesting, right? Because I think for Sterner, there's a way in which we can be bewitched and sorcelled. We can hallucinate that we naturally are born and we turn what Lacan kind of talks about the castration of the symbolic, right? By entering the symbolic, we sort of are castrated through language, we're split, we're barred, and we inherit and we sort of naturally, and again, this is like that second nature instinct, we naturally feel attached to our blood, our soil, our volk, right? All of these things that have a tendency to reinforce a kind of fascistic type of clinging, these attachments that I think that for Sterner, we need to become aware of, right? And so the fact that Sterner does have an idea of collectivity, the union of egoists, where we get to choose our friends, we get to choose our family, we get to choose our quote unquote nation, if you're going to call that union a nation. And that's something that has to be put into practice. And that's not necessarily something that we're born into and that we can freely just choose. I think that that's something that, whether it be a part of our political or ideological evolution, we are, we are not there yet, right? We're still bound in these collectivities, these molar collectivities, including the nuclear family, right? That gives us this idea of patriotism or filial duty. And those ideas are very strong, partly because we've internalized them and we see that not according ourselves and harmonizing, harmonizing ourselves with these ideals shuns us and makes us persona non grata. We become immoral, right? And we, I think that Scherner shows how that type of internalized shame takes on this weight of guilt, becomes these burdens that it's only by buying into that that seems to be the avenue for freedom. And I think that for Sterner, that's, that's a kind of underhanded way of doing things. And, um, and yet, what he's diagnosing at this moment, right, in this first part, maybe why it felt redundant or preliminary or too familiar for you is the fact that, I mean, like, what he's doing in this first part is pretty much on the whole trying to clear the ground. Right, you brought up deterritorialization earlier. I think it is trying to show that the territories in which we are sort of born, and I mean territory in a in the broadest sense, right, right. and I include the family, I include our little slice of of the earth that puts us in family ties and nation ties and state ties. I mean, I think that like for you know, I think that it for perhaps we still aren't there yet right whether or not it'll come naturally through any sort of evolution is, is is sort of up in the air and i don't even know if sterner would probably put the idea of progress in the same type of spook category we gotta yeah. be a little bit care careful right. about yeah progress qua reason is you know is basically what it would come down to i guess that that's that's the thing i think that there is this Obviously, this tension between civil society as Hegel develops it and starting from abstract right and this question of mutual recognition as reinstantiating the ties that bind. And, you know, Sterner, I think, is trying to understand or reconceive how we tie the ties. Do we not come into the world already tied to all of these, these different beings? And then as we grow and learn, we, we develop 
these other ties to this more abstract territoriality of spirit, of reason, of right. humanity. There is this whole tiered and staggered layering of, of all these different ties that we have to kind of buy into. And um, I don't know if we can ever like fully free ourselves, but there is this sense in which you can start to see that Dorainziga, the unique one that Sterner's trying to uncover and excavate this creative nothing is very close to like that other side of the assemblage. You know, one side of the assemblage is facing the strata, all these different stratifications that Sterner is trying to. Right. Yeah. The show yeah, us. Gotcha. And then the other side is, is facing the body of the organs. And there's a sense in which like Dreinziga is takes on that again, why body with organs is, is just, it's not even a great concept, right? Cause it's, what does it mean that it's a body <laughs> and it's not necessarily opposed to the organs, but to the organization of the organs, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, you can you know, see very clearly you know. there, I think the relationship to Sterner, even Sterner, I think wants to emphasize to some degree, like the material of the body. There's a certain like Platonism that he's arguing against where the, the ideal forms are superior to the actual body and my self interest. Again, going back to the Palestinian Israeli situation, right? The morality of the idea of morality itself would prohibit any sort of actual meaningful resistance for the Palestinians against the occupation of, of Israel. There's a sort of no win situation for them because things have to have a certain force behind them, right? Ideas have to have be invested in libidinally. Maybe that's where this Joker quote of people are only as good as the world allows them to be. It's like, we're only as good as our libidinal investments allow us to be or something like that. Again, going back to the US, they say, we say, oh, Israel represents our ideals. And in a kind of really twisted way, they do. We already went through that. So I don't know that we need to rehash that. I would even say maybe to go back to one uh, sort of cornerstone pop culture reference that we always go back to is Ned Stark executing the deserter from the Night's Watch. Because here, it kind of does, there's a certain weird, you can view this in a number of different ways, because the deserter is following their self-interest. They're not following this greater social idea of morality, which would be to fulfill their obligations as a Night's Watch, right? They've taken the vow, they serve the greater good of the realm of humanity right yeah. exactly and yet so sterner's involved here because of that sort of the deserter sort of pursuing their self-interest and yet encounters the law which doesn't really take into account the specific situation that led the deserter at both ends the deserter is threatened with the loss of his life. Whether he complies with, at least if he flees, he has a chance to yeah. maintain his life. But he can stay on the wall and he can die there, or he can be flee and be caught under the law and die in that sense. But notice that the way that, that the deserter dies is in the face of the inhuman, his own self-preservation kicks in, like you said, and he flees. But in the face of the law and this higher thing, he still kind of relents and just kind of, what does he say? Does he say like, you know, I can't remember if he says like, don't tell my family I was a coward or I died. You know, it was, it's, he says something, but he relents in the face of Ned Stark because now he recognizes this human authority again, this abstraction of the law. And it is even if it is impersonal and to a certain extent abstract and inhuman, it is embodied by this paragon of honor, which is Ned Stark's, that's the hubris of Ned Stark. If you want to call, talk about like a heroic flaw, obviously Ned Stark's like honor, placing that above all else. But he relents in the face of, of, being, of being executed. He doesn't run from, from Ned. Well, he's coming. I mean, he's caught and brought. I mean, before. he's caught, I mean, he's like, but, but he's not putting up a fight to the death. I suppose, yeah. You're, against yeah, you're Ned right. Stark, you know what I'm saying? Like, he, yeah, yeah, at yeah. a certain level, he he relents to... Acquiesces to, yeah. Yeah, to this form of punishment. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. 
I've also articulated this a few times in the past about how the guy's telling the truth, but he's not believed. Yeah, of course. So it's like, for Ned, he's operating on this categorical imperative of the deserter must be executed. What if every man who took the black ran away from the wall? Exactly. So we have to right. uphold we have to uphold this abstract law regardless of the specifics of the situation. The, I guess this doesn't really necessarily have a place here, but the gods take back because of this. He killed the innocent. He has to fulfill that debt of innocence himself later on in the text he submits to the law but he does so out of i mean even in the end he calls himself a traitor deference to his fan right he wants to protect his unique family even in the end he proclaims joffrey the rightful king which is a lie whether or not whether or not, he, yeah <laughs> he, he tells he he, he uh, we can assume at least that he's not freely right. asserting something that he believes he knows better, but it's precisely that knowledge that gets him killed. It's so, precisely pursuing that knowledge and the fact that he doesn't go as far as he goes up to the level of what honor and propriety and protocol will allow, but he doesn't go further. He doesn't do what Cersei says, take the throne for himself or whatever the fuck, which is not necessarily what he wants to do, but that's very much he does not go far enough with his egoism. It stops short. There's so many little like threads that are like shooting off in opposite directions from that whole situation, right? Because I do think the kind of moral or ethical code that I do appreciate from Ned Stark is the one that passes the sentence should carry out the execution. Because I think that to swing the sword, yeah, right. There's this like, like that's a good dialectical tension there because Joffrey could never. Funny though, the two that they both kind of behead innocent men. I don't know if you have any well, responses to any of that further, or if we can move on. I mean, no one seems to believe Ned Stark at the very beginning when he, whether or not um, Peter Baelish believes Ned that Joffrey is illegitimate doesn't matter. Peter's going to use chaos as a ladder, yada, right. yada, right? He's going to get his, get what he wants out of it until he meets his untimely end later in the show. But no one believes Ned Stark by declaring Joffrey illegitimate. So he is in that kind of similar aspect as the deserter. At the end, yeah, you're right. He, like his self-interest is involved in protecting his family. If he was a truly an egoist and wasn't bound by the ties of honor and name right. and and family, then he could have. Yeah, he, could, he obviously he'd be a different character, but he, right. he he wouldn't be in that situation. He's bought into the system in a way that Littlefinger is not. Like Littlefinger is not beholden to that, and it was kind of interesting too because Littlefinger himself represents this this burgeoning merchant class, like mm -hmm. the capitalist class. Whereas the old guard, right, they didn't necessarily, Tywin Lannister wasn't concerned about finance capital the way that Littlefinger was like, was. Littlefinger was not beholden to these sort of spooks that the way that these older feudalist lords and so forth were to this prior order. Although that prior order certainly like held their power and et cetera in place. So it's like the necessity of the feudal system is what generates the little finger character in a sense. I mean, Tywin's main flaw is instead of honor, it's the longevity of the name of the family name that allows him to succeed. And that's also his fatal flaw. Ruthless pragmatism. The name Lannister that he salvaged from utter ruin and turned into one of the main powers of the realm. He's too concerned with the decisions he makes is too concerned with upkeeping that name and continuing it and making it the powerhouse that, that he made it. You know, But it's almost like a Machiavellian thing for him too, because he's willing to do ends justify the means for him, right? He's willing to cross all the ethical boundaries that are set forth in 
Westeros to be perceived as strong, to be perceived. It's not about even like having honor because honor isn't a necessarily, he's not worried about honor. He's worried about the actual, like what gets shit done, so mm -hmm. to speak, like yeah. what actually materially seizes and takes power versus Ned. It's like, oh, it's the reverse. He's not interested in taking power. He's interested in upholding these spooks. Well, it's the old ways, right? It's kind of the ways of the old gods. He has this interesting line here about children that I kind of was pointing to a little bit earlier. I'll just go ahead and read this real quick. They proclaim that the mind is to be used against everything, but they are still far from the sacredness of the mind because they value it as a means, a weapon, just as cunning and defiance serve children for the same purpose. Their mind is incorruptible reason. This isn't exactly it, but kids say the darndest things. Like, children aren't necessarily bound by decorum, maybe would be the way to say it. They don't know that they're supposed to lie, yet they haven't learned to lie, to sublate their own the self-interest. Yeah, they haven't learned the noble lie, the white lie. He says that they, their mind is still too tied up with things. And it's when the child grows a little bit older, becomes a youth, not yet a man, right? But a youth that their mind erects these ideals, right? There's an idealism of youth. And it's not until you get to the, the adult that interest becomes the main driver. And I think that this way of, briefly sketching out the evolution is Sterner just shows how hollow or how disinterested our interests can actually be when we invest into these these ideas of God or nation, these essences of the human and all this. I was thinking about this like God and all these things as alienated aspects of ourselves i don't know if that well that's all that's what sense. that's what for your says that's why for your replaces god with man they are these alienated there's not a self-consciousness of that maybe that's sterner's point is like the egoist does self-consciously recognize themselves as the creator of the world and in so doing it's not the world but their world right i mean that's the thing the world would still be a kind of spook just like True. the human. But you're right. I think that you're right. That taking Feuerbach further is to refuse to replace God with man. It's not this man, me. Right, yeah. It's, it's, still, abstract... it's still humanity, the human being above, right? So I think that that's where Stirner's vitriol comes from is just by replacing God with man doesn't mean, I mean, I think this is also too Nietzsche. There's a connection here, obviously with Nietzsche investigating the overman. Also you talking about the revolution being this sort of, sort of circular movement, right? Like, yeah, we, cause that's kind of ultimately Sternberg's point too, is like, yeah, we've had this sort of humanist revolution, but it's really just shuffling the chairs in a different order, but it's not really getting to the heart of the matter. Yeah, no more masters except for the law. You know, no more poverty except the poverty of all. No more God except for the disembodied essence of man. And he's like, none of those things for Sterner actually free us. They are, paradoxically, perhaps the movement of reason and world history and all that shit, but they reinstantiate and maybe come down on us even harder. So I think that's why Sterner, obviously, if you just look at the section on social liberalism, which is about 10 pages, and you see his remarks about socialism and humanism, or sorry, socialism and communism, if you just focus on that out of context, you might say that Sterner is this bourgeois idealist that Marx claims him to be. But I think that that is to focus in on one little aspect of his critique. Because he does end that section on social liberalism by saying, if labor became truly free, 
and this is not in the sense in which Deleuze and Guattari and Marx himself critique free labor, right? Because men have been freed from their servitude under the guilds, under feudalism, but they are also free for what? To sell their labor, their labor power, actually. But this double-edgedness of, of being free, you're free from something negative, but you're also free for something negative and doesn't mean you're better off. When Scherner says, if labor became truly free, and I think he means in the sense of egoists, he's like, look, all the proletarians really outnumber quite a lot those who are trying to subject them to this regime. And so you would have, I have to see exactly how he said it, but this is what would, I don't know if he uses the word of, of revolution, but let me, let me see if I can find it before we wrap up. Yeah, generally he prefers what he calls insurrection over so he says, revolution. Uh, but... Wait, was this not in the end? Hmm. I, I'm not seeing it, but, um, you know, one of the things in social liberalism that he's critiquing is, uh, how it tries to like level out fortune and there's something sort of good in that but it becomes uh this kind of contradiction because now society is the new master the new supreme being blah 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 let proper be be impersonal let it belong to society yeah, yeah. okay the workers have the most enormous power in their hands and if one day they became truly aware of it and used it then nothing could resist them they would only have to stop work and look upon the products of work as their own and enjoy them. This is the meaning of the labor unrest that is looming here and there. The state is founded on the slavery of labor. If labor becomes free, the state is lost. I think that that doesn't really sound like a bourgeois idealist. I mean, that sounds like communism. I'm going back now to think about our discussion with Adrian Johnston and the book Infinite Greed because we had a little bit of the discussion discussion there as well about self-interest and this presupposition that capitalism is all about self-interest when if that were true to some extent that's kind of an interesting thing too because why don't people simply act in their self-interest and steal or yada yada or like revolt or insurrection or any of that stuff and the uh, the flip side of that being why does someone continue to accumulate beyond their own self-interest or enjoyment if it was all about enjoyment you would sort of realize that enjoyment right instead of continuing to well, accumulate it's, it's, for this which i think sterner definitely would see that pursuit of wealth in this manner as a spook enjoyment has to be understood here and like if the accumulation of capital is not for enjoyment in a broad sense it still harbors aspects of Lacanian jouissance, right? Because as we know, jouissance is that undead that lives beyond me. It's the... I mean, the undead it's is kind, like it's literally kind of, it's kind a spook, of the, right? It's, it's the thing, though. That's what I'm saying. Like, beyond sort of that which goes on striving for this type of surplus where beyond any notion any mere notion of like pleasure if we think about the the human organism it's that which continues yeah. despite hold me tight and spit on me to go to leotard which actually i would be curious because that was something actually a good topic because it's almost like sterner wants to go back to this pre-modernist maybe form of difference or something do you think he's pre-modern you think he's I, trying I, to well, like revert I, it, uh, return? It, it, I'm trying to figure out. I I don't. I don't. Know. I don't think he. I don't think he necessarily has a positive vision. Yeah, maybe in not. In this yeah. sense, in the sense in which here's what we do: we roll back the clock. I don't. With what Scherner's saying, I don't think you can follow that path. I don't think you can go back. He's telling us 
that just because we disrupted and torn down these old hierarchies, we've erected new ones that are more ir- implacable in their place. Yeah, and the kind of so it's not necessarily, sense, right? I mean, it's not necessarily that he's saying we can go back and and go back to the time of kings and heroes and all of this, right? Like, yeah. I, if there is something quasi heroic in Dorinziga and the unique one, that may be a residue of something to critique. But I don't know that he's trying to assert that we can kind of go back. I mean, what are we going back to? Are we yeah, going back I to- mean, maybe in a sense, it's like this dialectical move of, okay, the next step beyond liberalism would be this self-recognition of our selves or something like that, which would kind of tie into Marx and blah, blah, blah. But again, I guess that kind of falls apart whenever you focus on the specific individual one, like I create my own reality. And so in that sense, like that comes across as bourgeois liberalism or sure, right. whatever. But I do, but I, but, I, but I think that, that we, instead of like erecting this new heroic self, which would then be something above me that would tie my activity down to. This is why I think Overman is very, we, if we were to bring in the Overman, we'd be very nuanced with how, what Nietzsche says about it. And yeah, because I don't know if he's really we, saying like self yeah, overcoming yeah. is not quite. That's not really what Sterner's, at least implicitly, and, and, and getting I at. I think that he would agree with self overcoming if, insofar as my self is something alienated and outside of me that I hold myself up to in this right. yeah, yeah. higher standard. We have to be very careful if we were, but I'm not going to bring it over man here. I just, I just want to. Sure. Like, yeah. Yeah. No. It's but a good I do think that that your point about this kind of going back. I don't know if that is true. And we also can't necessarily believe in some sort of dialectical movement of reason and progress. We have to be a little bit skeptical there too. But I do think that there is a sense in which Sterner aligns himself again with some post-structuralist tendencies like in Dulles and Guattari, yeah. where I feel like Sterner is calling for a kind of relentless decoding. There's a sense in which the decoding of capitalism is obviously not quite far enough because it's it's merely displacing its internal limits in order to to make yeah. room for this accumulation of surplus value right that, oh, that that's you, good which is why i think it's good you brought up adrian johnson so you can't go back to the old codes for sterner because those are spooks and you can't remain kind of tied with these to these despotic regime of overcodings and the question in, in which you know, the process of schizophrenia that the Liz and Guattari lay out in its sort of refusal to make temporary territorializations and surplus value. I feel like Sterner is on that side of, of this decoding. And so perhaps on the side of a kind of absolute deterritorialization, he's at least gesturing towards that. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, there could perhaps be these movements of re-territorialization but they but they shouldn't be hierarchized and given precedence because you know i think for him if you know i sort of espouse if i sort of land with my creative nothing at a certain point and acknowledge my properties my egoism is still not that thing it's not that resting point it still is this ongoing activity and not this one territory that i've provisionally set up so it's tough i mean it's tough because now we're trying to translate into the the idea of capitalism and schizophrenia those two volumes but i do think that there's an alignment yeah i mean there is a kind of anti edipality transcendent idea of the family as the notion of the family could be it's just another spook maybe that's implied it's not explicit per se I, even though he does you know he does bring up the family quite a bit i mean i think he sees it as the provisional way in which society is working and and you know we are not necessarily born as unique ones right we have to kind of birth ourselves or we have to give birth to it through an intense struggle right i don't think that sterner is is laying out that the process he's 
asking us to consider is is anything easy or is like the drowning man imagining air because i don't think for sterner it's something necessarily imaginary yes one could read him sometimes this way as though it were easy enough to will these things away but i don't know if it's sheerly just will right i mean i think that that's a part of it but i think that you know like nietzsche we have to think differently in order so we can like will differently in order so we can feel differently there are these concatenations of events that can come from changing our perspective but if you don't begin with thinking differently about these spooks these phantasms that that we allow to bewitch us and hold power over us including the power of reason and philosophy and these other things this is why you said sterner is kind of an anti-philosopher and i would agree with you there Maybe that's where Lacan and Sterner are copacetic. Again, yeah, yeah. I, again, yeah, I agree. Um, Not to mention they're like, I think, they're both riffing on Hegel <laughs> too, to some extent, is the source of that as well, which I've mentioned of plenty of times. I guess to wrap up, I would be curious, because you did mention, and this is kind of continuing a little bit of this thread, would be, you kind of mentioned, I was saying like, okay, maybe Sterner is like this Baudrillard, but you were saying Leotard in his, in his evil period is kind of where would be more befitting of Sterner or they would have some valence. And I'm just curious what your thoughts were on that. I don't know if, uh, you know, Sterner can be identified necessarily with either. He's, he's, he's a unique guy, right? You know, he's, he's a, he's a unique one, but I was thinking more that I think that, you know, he shares with Baudrillard in a kind of virulent dissolving, which could end in nihilism, even though Baudrillard and Leotard and, and everybody is like, no, this is not nihilism. I mean, yeah, sure. I think with Leotard, I was thinking about the way in which he describes the libidinal ban and insofar as it cools down is where we get these terms insofar as the libidinal band is is still rotating you know at infinite speed which is like the speed of thought or something right not thoughts as they are concretized and cooled down which is what we get when the libidinal band cools down but the so the process of of thinking thinking through and working through that's the type of now i mean Obviously, Leotard uses the image of the band, but I, I was thinking also of the great zero, right? There is this sense in which Sterner's creative nothing, this belief in creation ex nihilo of Der Einzige is this like reclaiming that heat of the libidinal band before it's sort of settled down into creating these hierarchies and these these distinctions but also in in leotard's in this period his um his refusal to participate in the negativity of critique that even if there are critical moments and we we sort of have to inevitably have these critical moments that there's a sense in which leotard is calling for this deepening and acceleration of decadence that I think Sterner would agree with because it's only through this acceleration of decadence that we keep from satisfying ourselves with being situated towards this, these higher ideas and spooks and phantasms that, that would then have the time to congeal into a force that allows us to like settle into it as this new territory whether obviously you know from god to man you know it's the process has not gone far enough so this positive process of decadence is where i see leotard's evil period being sternarian it's the difference between the negotiation of norms and values and the the sort of process of of evaluation that there's a way in which evaluation as the transmutation of all values as nietzsche might say can congeal 
right? And try to halt the eternal return, try to prevent that movement. So maybe that is it. Maybe that's what Deleuze is thinking when he, he says that Strenner leads the dialectic or shows the dialectic to be leading towards nihilism. You know, I think Leotard, it's a question of what we mean by nihilism it becomes very tricky and that would take another few hours because for Stirner, the creative nothing nihilism is a preliminary moment in the movement of transvaluation so yeah i mean it's i think it's tough and i think that we have to wait to see a little bit further into the book but i do feel like we are you know, this part is definitely focusing on the, the critical, polemical aspect. And it's preliminary work to be done, but it's not the end-all, be-all, I don't think. We've gone through the destructive moment. We had to clear away the horizon in order to start fresh. That's kind of what I see this first part doing. Maybe something we can tease for next time. I'm Although maybe it's not present as much, I don't recall in the text, but the notion of predicates, the man without predicates, etc. Would the fixed ideas be these predicates, these images of thought, constraining action and so forth? I don't know. I don't know Lara well enough to, well enough, but I think you were saying something about like ordinary man that might had some surveillance that we can maybe leave for the next time we dive back into this book. You know, with Laruel, there's a radical distinction between man as one and the world. And the world would include all of those rational determinations, you've called them predicates, that would want to parcel out man into various regions to be studied. There's language, power, sex, race etc right all of these which of these dogs wants to die no i'm just kidding. well it's yeah <laughs> i mean it's it's that it's it you know for laura well their radical eminence is refusing to determine man by these what he calls authorities right these predicates that i said so refusing to determine man or we could say derinzaga the the unique one by by these attributes and uh i think that that's partly what sterner is doing here right refusing to determine man based on nation state family religion etc yeah, that's true yeah i think we did a pretty fair reading of it and i'm pretty happy with what we did and we did something i think <laughs> unorthodox perhaps largely with this text that hopefully will resonate with our listeners i mean i feel like it probably will pretty well but we'll return to this text at some point what do we have we're looking at next week to be determined then we'll figure out something in this similar trajectory but we'll go ahead and call it quits and this will be the machinic unconscious happier with cooper cherry and taylor atkins signing off the very rules of eating of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can you one state of things, a pure violence without object. This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. What I meant is the following. Nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a block work orange. <laughs>